Well, once again, we welcome you and thank you for being here at church today. Um, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. Today, the title of my message in our series on culture shock, responding to today's most controversial issues. We're going to talk about the truth about homosexuality. What do you say to your gay friend, your gay family? I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act of adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I don't think I have to convince anyone in this room today that one of the most controversial issues of our culture today is that of homosexuality and gay marriage. Every day, it seems, there is a headline in the news media concerning this issue and debate. Just this week, delegates to the annual Boy Scouts Convention voted to accept openly gay scouts into their troops. Last Sunday, someone came up to me and handed me an Associated Press article entitled, Same-Sex Marriages Now Legal in France. France is the most populous country to have legalized gay marriage and the 12th worldwide. This past Tuesday, Minnesota became the 12th state to legalize same-sex marriage. As of May 2013, 12 states, Connecticut, Delaware, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington, as well as the District of Columbia and three Native American tribes have legalized same-sex marriages. In addition, California, which briefly granted same-sex marriage in 2008, recognizes them on a conditional basis. The topic of homosexuality and gay marriage and same-sex couples adopting children has been controversial for years. Unfortunately, the church hasn't always responded well when dealing with these issues. An awful lot of Bible-believing Christians who really, really love God when it comes to homosexuality and the homosexual community are really afraid. And a lot of people in the homosexual lifestyle are really afraid of Christians, and that's sad on both counts. So as we start, I'd like to ask the homosexual community, and this is being videotaped, so it's gonna go out on YouTube later today, and I wanna ask the homosexual, homosexual community on behalf of the Christian community for your forgiveness. There have been two extremes in how people and churches who claim Christianity respond to homosexuals and the social issues related to the gay lifestyle. Let me highlight what I just said. People and churches who claim Christianity and do things in the name of Christ. There are people who wear the Christian label but do not reflect the true nature, character, and teachings of Jesus. While they wave the Christian banner, they're Sinos. You know what a Sino is? Christian in name only. 
Sinos lay claim to Christ but do not live out his will and ways and how they do life. And because of this, the world around them labels them accurately hypocrites, judgmental, and oftentimes even hateful. I think the best example uh, is from the news again. Pastor Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. If you want to visit his website, all you have to remember is www.godhatesfags.com. They have a whole tab on their website entitled God's Hatred. And they've listed 13 scriptures where the word hatred appears. Unfortunately, they don't understand that God's hatred is directed towards sin and not the people who sin. And they've even said and footnoted on that website that the greatest lie ever told is God loves everybody. So on one end of the spectrum, we have people who claim Christ displaying hatred toward homosexuals, calling them names, berating them, joking about them, degrading them, avoiding them, and doing everything they can to isolate from them as if it were some kind of a disease that you could catch if you were in near proximity, beating them up at times, persecuting them in the name of Christ, picketing their funerals with hateful sayings, all in the name of Christ. Some even pick their funerals with placards that says, says, God loves to send fags to hell, this Westboro Baptist Church. Some Christian leaders will even go so far as to blame natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes as God's judgment against this sin in a particular community. But then you have the other end of the spectrum. And there are churches who claim Christ and emphasize love and acceptance, but don't share any truth. The United Church of Christ is one example. The United Church of Christ teaches that God loves everyone just the way they are, and they will affirm you in your lifestyle choice, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, and it matters not because God loves everyone. There's no need to stop or change any of your actions because if you're that way, God must have made you that way. And despite what the Bible says, times have changed, so we need to change even if that means we have to change what the Word of God says or means. On their website, you can find the UCC has no rigid formulation of doctrine or attachment to creeds or structures. So basically, everyone do what feels right to you, and God loves you no matter what, and we're all going to heaven. Hallelujah. The first extreme, and the only experience that many people in homosexual have had with Christians or people who claim Christ, is one of very angry, crazy people, some who have been very violent towards them. And the absolute love of God is completely missing. And so I can understand why the homosexual community is afraid of Christians. Under the banner of Christi Christianity as well, there are other groups who say to the homosexual community, homosexuality is not sin. You're not only welcome, but we'll ordain you as our priests and our bishops. Don't worry about it. These professing Christians and churches don't tell the homosexual, homosexual community any truth at all. When you learn that the average life expectancy of a homosexual male is only 42 years old, half that of the heterosexual male, and you know that, and you're not telling them that, that's not love. To not tell the truth about what the lifestyle does is not loving. And so we have one group that pounds on the truth without any love, and another group that pounds on, the, on love without any truth. So here's what I want to do. I want to walk with you on this journey. First and foremost, for us to understand so that we can be a church and individuals who know the truth and then can speak the truth in love. And I want to walk through two basic positions. So often we have emotions, there's a lot of heat, but very little light. So I'll walk through the basic presuppositions of the homosexual community. Then I want to walk through the basic presuppositions of Bible-believing Christians. And we're going to look at what science says, what research says, and what the Bible says. Which of these line up most accurately with the facts? 
Let's begin with the presuppositions of the homosexual community. It's a moral alternative sexual orientation. I was born gay, therefore homosexuality is an identity. It's who I am. And if it's who I am and I'm made this way, then it's normal and it's natural. And if it's normal and it's natural, you may have a different idea about sexuality, but this is just an alternative way to live in your sexual practice. And finally, if I made this way, if it's normal, if it's natural, then it's a civil rights issue. <laughs> Genders, people of different races, they're protected by civil rights, so we in the homosexual community should be protected as well. I want you to think about it for a minute. If you believe those presuppositions were true with all your heart, can you see why you might be pretty angry at people who call you names? Or say everything about you is invalid? Or even that you need to change? What I want you to do is do what my mother taught me to do. Don't tell me how I should feel until you've walked in my shoes. I want you to try and put yourself in their place for a moment. Believing what they believe, how would you feel? That's a way of thinking that produces certain attitudes and behaviors. By contrast, the Bible would teach, Bible-believing Christians would say, homosexuality is an immoral, prohibited sexual lifestyle. That you're not born this way, but it's a learned or developed behavior. And so what's prohibited is homosexual or same-sex behavior. The Bible doesn't declare that people may not be tempted. You can be tempted with same-sex attraction. Temptation in and of itself is not sin. But the Bible does say that same-sex behavior is prohibited and that it's sinful. The Bible teaches that it's not something that you are. Homosexuality is something that you do. And there's a huge difference. And if it's something that you do as a learned behavior that's prohibited by God, then it's abnormal and unnatural, and far from being an alternative lifestyle, it is a destructive lifestyle. The homosexual, homosexual lifestyle is destructive relationally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It is a moral issue, not a biological issue. So turn the page with me and let's go on this journey. What, is, what does science say? What does research say? What does the Bible say? And I'm going to take you through seven premises. We won't get through all of them today, most likely. But I want to take you through these seven premises. I want to encourage you to write them down because I think that once you understand this and see this, it will help you in ministering to and reaching out to the homosexual community. Because every one of us, most likely in this room, every one of us knows someone who is in the gay lifestyle or is struggling with same-sex attraction. And you have a way that you can make a difference in their lives. Maybe you today struggle with it yourself. And you don't know what to do about it. Listen carefully. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring truth into your heart. Premise number one. I was born this way. Premise number one, I was born this way. In 1991 and 1993, Newsweek magazine came out with a big splash, and the whole article was, Are You Born Gay? The first study that made national promise was by a, a man by the name of Simon LeVay. Simon LeVay's study came out in 1993, which he pretends that there is a biological basis for homosexuality, and basically said that we know there's a genetic link which causes homosexuality. And his study included research on 35 men who had died. It was thought of this group had 16 who were heterosexual and 19 who were homosexual. And as he studied the um, dead bodies, he found a different size in the hypothalamus gland. So from this finding, Simon LeVay concluded that there is an obvious genetic link to homosexuality. That there's a homosexual gene, which gives a predisposition for someone to be homosexual. Now as the scientific community did intensive research trying to confirm LeVay's study, 
and findings, they discovered that LeVay never verified whether the 19 men were really heterosexual or really homosexual. Both doctors who did this were homosexual scientists and by their own admission were looking for a link to help people deal with all the guilt and the shame and make a link of why people are homosexual. Because if you were born this way, therefore you can't help but live out the behavior because it's a genetic predisposition. But what the scientific community discovered is that the study of Simon LeVay was deeply flawed. They had exceptions in a very a small sample group of homosexual males. Three people in the homosexual group had larger hypothalamuses, and three people in the um, heterosexual group had uh, larger hypothalamuses. So they had people in both groups that had the same thing going. So even though the study did not hold up scientifically, when you do research looking or a biological link that gives a predisposition to homosexuality, you will find that Simon LeVay's study is quoted often as proof evidence, even though the scientific community itself said that the study was deeply flawed. A second study was done, and it was supported by Dr. Michael Bailey of Northwestern University and Dr. Richard Pillard of Boston University. And they reported in male identical twins when one is a homosexual, the other is three times more likely to be a homosexual than fraternal or non-identical twins. Now this study is another study that is often quoted as evidence of a biological link for homosexuality. And it was cited in that big Newsweek articles in 91 and 93. What's interesting is the flaws of the study were the same sample size. 48% of the identical twins we're not homosexual. Wait a minute. What you're saying to me is, if you have identical twins and one of them is a homosexual, then that gene is in both of them because identical twins share the exact same genetic code. Well, then how come only 48% of the other twin were homosexuals and 52% were not? Because if it is a genetic issue, then should not 100% of the uh, homosexuals in, that are identical twins both be homosexual? But that's not what the study proved out. Here's what I can say about the genetics. There's a whole lot of research that's been done. Many have tried to establish a genetic link for the predisposition to homosexuality. However, the research simply does not validate that outcome. There is no correlation between genetics in any way to homosexual behavior or origin. Studies by John Hopkins University, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a pro-homosexual scientist, Evelyn Hooker, and Masters and Johnson all deny that there is any genetic link to homosexual behavior. They agree that the connection between genetics and homosexuality is a myth. So then, if research is clear about the matter, then how can so many people accept that there's a biological disposition toward homosexuality? And what you, why do so many homosexuals believe I was born this way? Well, you should learn this fact. In popular culture, particularly if you're a young person, if you say something long enough and loud enough and often enough, people will begin to believe it. Amen. And they'll accept it as fact. They don't know why they accept it as fact, but if that's all they hear, and they hear it loudly voiced, then they accept it as fact, even though all of the research denies that reality. This is what young people in a Bible teaching church who go to school and talk to a friend are told. You know what? Those feelings, that attraction you had, you're homosexual. You were born that way. We'll talk more about develop, developmental factors, but let me just mention now, when you do all the research, you find that there are five or six developmental factors. If it's not genetic, then how do people have these alternative sexual attractions? In sexual identity, the father in the family plays a huge role. You find an absent father, or an abusive father, or a disengaged father, or a smothering mother, or early sexual abuse, 
A young man who just recently came out of a homosexual lifestyle had a drug addiction and homosexuality. And he said, I never made the link between my early childhood abuse and my drug addiction and homosexuality. He said, I just, I thought God hated me and I couldn't understand what happened or why because of what I've been through. This is not the case in all family conflict issues. Low self-esteem, failure to bond with the same sex parent. As you do studies, there's lots of developmental reasons. And by the way, every little boy and every little girl, if you notice when kids are small, Boys hate girls and girls hate boys. When they're young, those of you who work in the school system, you see this. Boys hate good. They got cooties. <laughs> they have cooties. Boy, little boys hate little girls. Until puberty sets in. And then we don't understand what happens, but those little girls you hated, now something's really different inside you. It's during that time, in those pre-teen, pre-puberty times, and during puberty, that when some of these developmental issues, and there are needs, and there's not a bonding, and there are different experiences that kids have, some kids don't go through the whole developmental process. Their development is retarded. And it's not like they make some choice. They can be six, seven, eight years, and have an attraction to the same sex and need to be nurtured and bonded and it never happens. <clears throat> when that happens, if you're told you were born this way, or if they're in a good Bible teaching church or a not so good Bible teaching church, that just hammers people and hammers people and equates same sex attraction with homosexuality, I'm telling you there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people in churches who grow up with these kinds of feelings and attractions and there is no safe place to tell anyone there's no place to get help. And they're sort of, oh, you'll get over it. Go, go date a girl. Go, go watch a movie. We'll talk about this and solve this problem later. And it's a developmental issue. The third factor is environmental factors. Let's talk about the immoral media of our nation that has normalized homosexuality. TV shows, remember Will and Grace, reality shows, movies, the internet, advertising in all its forms, TV shows like The New Normal or Modern Family have three different couples, one a gay couple. You have reality shows, you've got music, Katy Perry, I kissed a girl and I liked it. Everywhere what we see is this is just an alternative lifestyle and the media is blaring every day. This is normal. This is normal. This is okay. There's nothing wrong. You were born this way. It's all right. So pretty soon it gets accepted. The homosexual lifestyle is normal in music. It's normal even in comic books. As I was doing my research, I didn't realize this, but Marvel comic book heroes, North Star, is one of the first gay comic book characters who just married his interracial boyfriend in comic books. Now, who is the audience for comic books? Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Not anymore. Well, not, anymore. Not, not just kids, but they're directed toward kids, and then other kids who are older kids continue to read them some all their lives. Not saying there's anything wrong with reading comic books. I had a huge collection until my mother just threw them away one day because thought I didn't need them anymore. I was in college and came home and looked for my comics and they were gone, along with my Lionel train set. Two hard wounds to the heart. Another factor that plays into the normalcy of the homosexual lifestyle is the whole wild bisexual movement. Now this has nothing to do with how you grew up. It's about satisfying sexual urges. Doesn't matter if it's with a man or a woman. There are people who are just sexually charged and want to have an experience. It's the Dennis Rodmans of the world. You know, I play basketball by day and I wear a wedding dress by night and I'll have sex with anybody anytime. And that's part of the vile side that's scary. This is often about people that are taking advantage and even seducing people who are vulnerable. I read the story of someone who, whose close friend lost their wife tragically and they had a daughter away in college. 
And the daughter was away at college and she's grieving the loss of her mother who she was very close to. And she was an athlete. And she had a mentor in the athletic department who was an older woman. And the older woman was there and she happened to be a lesbian. And this older woman brought comfort and help. And over the course of helping her through her grieving, introduced her to the homosexual lifestyle. So in one of the most vulnerable moments of this girl's life, that's how she got into the homosexual lifestyle. She had legitimate needs. And there are lots of different ways. She had heart needs, and we all have them. People want to get connected and want to be loved. And here's someone who will offer that connection to you and accept you and walk with you and then are seduced. Now the fact of the matter is this, some of you in this room, and some of us, when we wanted those needs met, we got involved in other things, drugs, alcohol, promiscuous homosexual sex, uh, heterosexual sex, workaholism. You know what we did. We just tried to solve those needs by different temptations. So before we judge and condemn, let's look in the mirror. Premise number one, I was born this way. Scientific research does not bear this out. There are many development factors which play into some of this lifestyle choice. The media is screaming loudly that this premise is true, but research and science has proven there is no genetic link. You were not born this way. Let me give you premise number two. 10% of the population is homosexual, so how could so many people be wrong? That's another premise. That statistic comes from the 1948 Kinsey Report. Yeah, 1948. It was called Project 10. So throughout public schools in many states, speakers came into health classes and told our elementary and junior high and high school students that 10% of you are homosexual. And the only way to really find out is to do some experimentation. So if you have a same-sex attraction or feeling, you were born a homosexual and you should test it out. Because it's normal, 10% of you are homosexual. There's nothing wrong with it. And that's been pervasive in our educational system for a long time. What you need to understand is the Kinsey Report, which was quoted again in that 1993 Newsweek magazine article, is also deeply flawed. It was done by volunteers out of a prison population. <laughs> Later on, a little bit more careful research, in 1991, the University of Chicago did a nationwide survey and found that about 1.7% of the population identified themselves as homosexual. In 1990 census, only 1% of the people reported to be homosexual. The most exhaustive study done in the nation, the American survey, is that 2.7% of males and 1.7% of females identify themselves as homosexuals in America. So all I want to say is that this mantra of you're born this way, that 10% of the population is homosexual, so how, how could it be wrong? This simply doesn't line up with the best science research, even done by those in the homosexual community, or the best research we know about what's happening in the population. So this premise, again, is wrong, and it needs to be gently and lovingly removed. Last one for today, number three. The homosexual lifestyle is a normal, healthy, alternative lifestyle. The key words, normal and healthy. The pictures that are portrayed is that I love this person very much. Just like you love your heterosexual partner, I love my homosexual partner. It's just the difference in how we express our love. And I think it's important to look at some medical statistics. I want to share with you some medical statistics concerning the homosexual lifestyle. And it is a bit graphic. But we need to say that. Because if you really love people, you tell them the truth. 78% of male homosexuals have or had a sexually transmitted disease, 78%. Two thirds of all the AIDS in the US are a direct, direct result from homosexual behavior. 50% of all homosexuals have gone
Homosexual young people are 23 times more likely to get a sexually transmitted disease. In San Francisco, the sexually transmitted disease rate is 22 times higher than the national average because there's such a large homosexual population. Lesbians are 14 times more likely to contract syphilis, four times more likely to have scabies, three times more likely to get breast cancer than heterosexual women. Listen to this. Only 3% of homosexuals are 55 years and older. Only 3%. And only 1% of homosexuals die of natural causes. Only 1%. The life expectancy of a male homosexual in America is 42 years old. We're talking about people not who have same-sex attractions alone, but who practice homosexual sex. So how do I say to someone I really care about, whatever you want to do is okay? You're only going to live half the length of your life that you were meant to live. And like a domino, what happens to you will affect other people. 40% of homosexual men have between one and 500 partners. The average homosexual man has over 100 partners in his lifetime. According to studies published in the journal AIDS, the average homosexual relationship lasts one and a half years. In his study of male homosexuality in, in, entitled Western Sexuality, Practice and Precept in Past and Present Times, the author Pollock found that few homosexual relationships last longer than two years, with many men reporting hundreds of lifetime partners. Now, there are monogamous, loving, caring homosexual relationships, as reported on TV and other areas. And there are. There are, some of you even may have a family member. I, we have a, a, I have a close friend that I've known here for years, I've known their family, and um, one of her sons is a homosexual man who has lived with his homosexual partner for over 20 years, and they have a very loving and very committed relationship. But the idea that that's the way it is, for most, is not true at all. And young people are being taken advantage of when they're told that that's the way it is. And if you believe that you're born this way and 10% of the population is this way and it's just a normal alternative, then these statistics that I've just quoted are kind of scary. People need to be understood, they need to be loved, and much of their behavior and their acting out isn't any different than your behavior or my behavior in acting out. But the sexual practices of homosexual is biologically very dangerous and destructive, as the health statistics have already shown us. The high rate of disease among homosexual males is due to unhealthy sexual practices. I gotta be graphic, I'm gonna be short, but I just, I need to say this because you need to hear it and understand it. The male body, is not designed for sexual practices with another male. 98% of homosexuals engage in oral sex and 99% practice anal sex with their partner. And during such activities, the anal wall is torn and bruised, giving male body fluids and germs direct access to the bloodstream. This causes massive immuno immuno immunological, that's, I'm not saying that right, immunological damage to the body's T and B cell defense mechanisms. This doesn't happen during heterosex because of the way God designed the female organs. Very graphic, very clear. But you just need to understand that when men have sex with men and women have sex with women, it is biologically destructive and that's why there's such a high rate of disease and why so many die so young. Because it violates God's design, his biological design for men and women. And those things aren't very often talked about publicly. Another, another issue is the fact, and it's very logical, that this lifestyle doesn't have the ability to produce. 
And historically, there has never been a society or a culture that has survived when homosexuality became mainstream and accepted by all. If you read the history of the Roman culture, part of the reason why Rome fell was because the homosexual practice was accepted by the culture as normal. And that brought about its demise. So instead of it being a lifestyle choice, in reality, it's a death style choice. Instead of judging and condemning and hating and isolating, we need to show love and care and compassion, speak truth and love so that those engaging in the homosexual lifestyle can understand the choices that they're making. Some say that people have a gay lifestyle are predisposed to this choice, giving the idea that they can't help making this choice. They're wired this way. And some research indicates that there could be a predisposition to the homosexual lifestyle. However, did you know that the evidence is far, far smaller compared to the predisposition that people have toward alcoholism? So if your parents or your grandparents were alcoholics, there is a strong predisposition that you can be an alcoholic. But how do we deal with the person who's got the alcoholic predisposition? Do we say to them, well, you're predisposed to alcoholism. Hey, your, your mom was a drinker, your dad was an alcoholic, your grandparents were alcoholics, so you're predisposed to alcohol, so belly up to the bar, drink up, go ahead, get drunk, and let us get drunk the rest of your life. Is that how we deal with them? No, no we don't deal with them that way. Yes, there may be a predisposition. Yes, there may be strong urges and, and uh, pressures in that direction. There are people who are predisposed to lying and predisposed to, to, <laughs> predisposed to stealing. So do we stay out and say, well, go ahead and steal and go ahead and lie. You're just predisposed to it. You really can't help yourself. You're a slave to your predisposition. Let me say it this way. We live in a fallen world and all of us have a genetic spiritual predisposition. The Bible calls it the sin nature. We we're all born with the propensity to sin and rebel. All of us. We're all in the same boat. Because this is a fallen world, we are all subject to temptations of varying kinds. What tempts me may not tempt you, but what is true, we are all tempted. And everyone say, Amen. 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 we are all tempted. We all need to know that we do not have to live a victim, though, to those predispositions. Because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross, I do not have to be a slave to sin. Galatians 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In Romans chapter 6, he says the very same thing. You do not have to be a slave to sin. What people need is to be loved and understood. They need to know that the same grace is available to everyone no matter what the temptation. But we need to get this on the table and care deeply about people so that truth and love will come in the same package. The third premise, the homosexual lifestyle is normal, healthy, alternative lifestyle <coughs> is simply not true by any rational measure. It's just not true. We're going to pause here. We're going to pick it up here next week. Let's bow and close in the word of prayer. I know, even in a smaller group as we have in here today, there are people, every one of us in this room, struggle with something. All of us have something that God delivered us from when he saved us. And I also know this, the devil didn't give up the day you were saved. The enemy of your soul continues to tempt you continues to lure you, continues to lay traps, hoping that you will snatch the bait and get hooked once again and be drawn back into the lifestyle that God delivered you out of. Whether it's homosexuality, whether it's lying, 
thieving or adultery or fornication or some other kind of sin, pornography, whatever it might be. Every one of us in this room face temptation. Every one of us have to struggle in this life. Unfortunately, the church has chosen to accept some sinners and their sins and then withdraw from some people and their sins. And the church has done a lousy job in ministering to the homosexual community. We have treated them with great disdain and in the name of Jesus, we have isolated from them and we have left them alone to battle in these struggles and temptation. And I want to ask you, church, how would you feel if it was your sin and your struggle? that caused you to be isolated and abandoned and left alone in your struggle. So we the church need to understand the truth so that we can declare the truth. And then we need to speak the truth in love with our goal to see restoration and healing and people come to the place of freedom. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul said, If any man is trapped in sin, you who are spiritual, go to them. Go to them. He didn't say, wait till they come your way. He didn't say, hope that they meander into the church somehow. He said, you who are spiritual, go to them. Reach out to them with a desire to bring restoration to their life. And don't have a judgmental mindset because you are tempted in the same way. You can fall just as easily. So let's our hearts be humble before the Lord. And let's ask God for the grace that each of us needs. I want you to think about your struggle today. What is, what is the demon that you wrestle with? What is that thing in your sin nature that God rescued you out of? And that you battle on a regular basis. Come to the Lord and find grace and mercy in time of need. Father in heaven, we come to you as your people this morning. And we say to you, we need you, Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And what? And what? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, help us to be free from the power of evil in our lives. Deliver us from temptation. Give us the grace and the strength to walk in purity and in holiness so that we can reflect your nature to the world around us. As our hearts are bowed, let me ask, is there anyone here this morning who would say, Pastor, I know that I am a sinner and things are not right between me and God right now. I need to confess my need of Jesus and ask him for forgiveness and ask him to save me to be my Lord and my Savior. The word of God promises you that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're here this morning, you would say, Jesus, I need you to save me. And you've never prayed and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And this morning you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the Lord. You lift a hand. I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here? You'd say, pray for me. Is there anyone here and you'd say, Pastor, I know things aren't right between me and God. I've been very distant. I've been walking at a distance. I want to put Jesus back on the throne of my heart and my life. I want to put him in the center of my life again. And you say, today, I just want to draw near to God. 
I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. You lift a hand today. I want to pray for you, sir. God bless you. Are there any others you say pray for me? God bless you. All right, church. Let's lift our voices. If you raised a hand, just open your heart to God. Turn your heart to Him. His hand is extended to you now. Grab hold of that hand with simple faith. Join me in this prayer, Heavenly Father. I come to you in Jesus' name. I really need you, Lord. I've sinned against you. And I ask for your forgiveness. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I surrender lordship of my life to you right now. Be my Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for mercy and grace. Restore my relationship with you now. I receive it by faith. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, bless each and every one of us today as we leave this house. Help us to reach out to people all around us who desperately need you. Bring glory and honor to your name, Lord, because you alone are worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Go in peace until we gather again. Hope to